Hi everyone, this is Tony Spinoza, and I want to welcome you to my cybersecurity training course. We will cover five short modules on how to increase your security online by changing a couple of your device's security settings. So let's get started with the first module, the firewall. The firewall is a computer network system that is designed to block unauthorized access while permitting outward communication. This means that you will increase your security and prevent cyber threats like fraud and viruses so you will be safe and protected by turning on the settings. So right here I've got an Apple MacBook Pro. I'm an Apple user and and I will make other videos for the Windows users through my other PC. So for an Apple user you would go to your system preferences which is this little gear icon right here and you will pull up the system preferences. Next you go to the security and privacy which is the little safe house lock item and you want to go to your firewall tab which is this third one right here. Mine is currently on but in order to make changes you want to click on the lock and then put in your password, unlock it, and the lock unlocks. So I'm going to turn mine off But I want to tell you that the firewall is turned on and set up to prevent unauthorized applications, programs, and services from accepting incoming connections. So this would be if somebody wants to send you a virus while you are online. This is why the firewall is important. important. So right now I'll turn it off. And all incoming connections to this computer are allowed. So does that make sense to you? How you would be permitting somebody externally from the internet to attack you from the internet. That's how this happens online, and that's why the firewall is very important. So we want to leave it turned on. So we'll prevent any unauthorized applications, programs, and services from accepting incoming connections. Okay, we are officially secure with the first module, the firewall. We have completed this step, so in another video I will show Windows users how to accomplish this, but it is similar. You go to the system settings and then security and privacy so let's go to the next module and cover data encryption thank you so much for watching hi everyone this is tony spinoza welcome to my cybersecurity training course and we will cover five short modules on how to increase your online security by changing your device's security settings let's get started with the first module the firewall a firewall is a computer network system designed to block unauthorized access while permitting outward communication. In device settings, under privacy and security, choose firewall and enable it. This will maximize your device network security and prevent cyber attacks like fraud and viruses. So right now, you should be able to see my computer screen. This is my Windows PC. And the way to turn on the firewall is you go over here to the lower left icon for the Windows Start and you click on this gear range which is the settings. Next we will go to the update and security. Next go to Windows Security and go to Firewall and Network Protection. This brings up another page. And here you can see that I've got my firewalls turned on. So let's click on a private network. And then you will see here Microsoft Defender Firewall. And here you can turn it on and turn it off. We want our Microsoft Defender Firewall to be turned on. And this is where you will know and trust the people and the devices on the network and your device is set as discoverable. The Microsoft Defender Firewall will prevent any unauthorized users from accessing your device. And this is how you properly do it on a Windows PC. Hi everyone, welcome to module two. 
where you will learn what data encryption is, what it's for, and how to use it. Data encryption is a computer process that secures your data using secret code that prevents fraud and malicious attacks. It requires extra time and storage memory, but it improves your speed and your overall security. What I noticed is that it sped up my browser slowed up times and they're almost instant now. So for Apple users, I want to show you how to do this. You want to go to your system preferences and click this gear icon. Next, click the security and privacy icon and you want to be on the file vault. This secures your data on your disk by encrypting its contents automatically. Mine is currently turned on. That's why it says turn off right here. And when you click turn on, it gives you a secret key. This code is very important. Take a picture and a screenshot of it and keep it in a safe place. You will need your login password or a recovery key to access your data. A recovery key is automatically generated as part of this setup. If you forget both your password and your recovery key, the data will be lost. Okay, so that is the encryption process. And right now, I need some power to finish mine. It's very time consuming, so plan accordingly. So if you want to learn more security features, follow me on to module number three. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone, this is Tony Spinoza. Welcome to module two, where you will learn what data encryption is, what it's for, and how to use it. Data encryption is a computer process that secures data using secret code that prevents fraud and malicious attacks. This process takes up extra memory and time, but can increase overall speed and security. I sped up my browser load up times, which are almost instant now. For the Windows PC users, what you want to do is open your settings, go down here to the Windows Start button, click on Settings, and you want to be on your Windows Update. You can also click on Install Now for any Windows updates that are available. I don't really use this computer, so I don't update it often, but I would have to update it in order to get one final feature that would say data encryption down here. It would, below, it would be below Windows Insider Program. Then you would click on the data encryption tab and you would turn it on like I showed you guys for the firewall. Device security is also here. And you would have another feature here after your update that would say data encryption. That is the process involved for data encryption for Windows PC users. And I will see you in the next module where we will learn about two-factor verification. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Spinoza, and today I will teach you about encrypting your app's files for an iOS device or Apple, Apple smartphones. And I just want to go over this overview. Data protection is an iOS feature that you use to secure your app's files and prevent unauthorized access to them. Data protection is enabled automatically when the user sets an active passcode for the device. You read and write your files normally, but the system encrypts and decrypts your content behind the scenes. The encryption and decryption process are automatic and hardware accelerated. You specify the level of data protection that you want to apply to each of your files. There are four levels available, each of which determines when you may access the file. If you do not specify a protection level when you create when creating a file, iOS applies the default protection level automatically. No protection, the file is always accessible. Complete until first user authentication, which is the default. And I'm just going to go over quickly. The next one is over complete unless open. And the last one is complete. The file is accessible only when the device is unlocked. So let's go over on how to do this. Um, I think I do want to read completely what it says over here because the first level of no protection, the file is always accessible. That would defeat the purpose and we wouldn't add security. 
and next complete until first user authentic authentic authentication excuse me which is the default the file is inaccessible until the first time the user unlocks the device. After the first unlocking of the device, the file remains accessible until the device shuts down or reboots. Third level, complete unless open. You can open existing files only when the device is unlocked. If you have a file already open, you may continue to access that file even after the user locks the device. You can also create new files and access them while the device is locked or unlocked. And then the complete level, the file is accessible only when the device is unlocked. So how do you do this? You go to your home screen, go to your settings, next go to your touch ID and passcode. I have a passcode set but let's pretend that somebody doesn't. And this is for data encryption but as you can see the little red thumbprint fingerprint I've got them set to five fingers to recognize this. So you would go here to the change passcode. It would tell you to put one in. So you would put one in there and it, you would make sure that you have this set to immediately require a passcode. Right here at the bottom you can see I have data protection is enabled and that is because I've got a passcode. So that's how you would put a, a passcode and it would make you go in here and press one on. You can't see the rest of the screen which has numbers but you've got the series of numbers which you can choose from but you can't see that right now through your screen. So I will cancel out of there. And this also enables people to create the fingerprints. So let's try doing that real quick. Adding a fingerprint. It looks like I've got them filled. And I've got finger five. This is finger one. Let's try deleting finger 5 and then adding a fingerprint place your finger lift and rest your finger on the home button repeatedly I'm going to use my right hand pinky there's two three four five six seven oops keep going to capture and continue the edges of my print so now it wants to get the edges. Make sure that I get the edges. Okay, that is complete. Touch ID is ready. So this means touch identification and is using biometrics or your the scanning of your fingerprint. And your print can be used for unlocking your iPhone. And this is pretty cool. Right now I will show you. I am locking. Okay. And I think it went back. So back again, you can't see the numbers, but you can see, and here we have it again. So there it is, finger five. So that is how you enable your data encryption and your fingerprint passcodes. So move on to the next module, and I will see you there. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, this is Tony Espinosa. Welcome to module three, where you will learn what two-factor verification is, which uses text message codes to secure your email account. Whatever email account that you've got, go to it and then go to your account. Click on Manage Account and go to your security. I've already tried this step, so in order to protect my identity and my cell phone number, I'm not going to put it on, that's why it's turned off. So protecting your account with two-step verification is every time you sign into your Google account, you'll need a password and a verification code. They text you the code, it's very fast. It adds an extra layer of security and you enter your password and the unique verification code that's sent to your phone. If someone steals your computer, 
they won't be able to access anything because they would need to steal your cell phone as well and they would need the password to it again that's why passwords and two-step verifications are very important so in order to get started you gotta put in your device and then you continue with it and then you put in your cell phone and you can get the code via text or phone calls you put in your cell phone number you just type it in and then you press send and it will immediately send to your phone and then once you hit send they will have you put in the code and you'll be able to turn on this two-step verification so this is very important and that is how you complete this step for two-step verification so we are not complete with this module next I will teach you about creating algebraic passwords so follow me on to module number four thank you for watching this is Tony Spinoza welcome to module four where you will learn about creating algebraic passwords algebraic passwords include about 10 to 15 characters and they are listed like this so think about algebra and the equations so let's begin by stating the obvious right now I am NOT in a secure website what this means is that it can have malicious activity or it could be privately owned and many different things but this one is going to be okay for now something you do want to avoid is clicking on ads or anything that looks out of the ordinary so let's begin I'm going to show you a couple of passwords that I've created so right now uh, let's look at these additions you want to have one of each each character that way it's it has variety so we will choose uh, characters like the exclamation points the at the pound the money sign uh, the percentage ampersand the asterisk parentheses the plus and minus signs and anything else that you can think of one uppercase lowercase number symbols and um, we want to avoid repeating characters consecutive letters and consecutive lowercase letters and consecutive numbers okay so let's begin when we create our first equation parentheses and dash six and I want you to be able to see this guys so let's do something like that that will be our first exponent and then we will try one capital letter one exclamation point a number and then a lowercase letter some parentheses and then we'll put another uppercase another number lowercase and then another character so we took off with a lowercase letter and we can add a number and then another character and we will finalize with this okay so very strong you can see all the points that we've accumulated over here and do we have any repeat characters that are case sensitive I'm not sure we do but let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So the more characters you have, the more complex it'll be to hack or to commit fraud and any malicious activities. So that is how you create uh, an algebraic password. So next in module 5, we will learn about disconnecting outdated internet products. So I will see you on the next module. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone, this is Tony Spinoza. Welcome to the last module number five. You will learn how to disconnect old internet devices to finalize increasing your cybersecurity. If you have an old computer, a printer, a modem, or a router that you're not using, it would be best if you disconnect it from the internet by physically removing the cables like this. Here I've got an old CenturyLink modem that I'm not using. And if I kept it on and there was sensitive data, cyber criminals could access that data and use it for fraud. So one way to do it is to disconnect it from the power source. But that's not going to keep you safe because they have a small battery inside and it still keeps the unit on and connected to the Internet. So anybody could access the data and hack it. 
Next, we want to disconnect all the cables going from the modem to the router, the printer, or an old computer, and that will prevent from any access. And all of these are unauthorized. And if you have a small business or a large organization and any sensitive data, you can actually remove the memory hard drive unit and keep it in a safe place. All these old devices that you don't want, they can be thrown in the trash, they can be recycled at Best Buy, or you can donate and sell them to specialized computer repair facilities. So with that being said, that is how you disconnect all devices from the internet. Don't forget to turn off the Wi-Fi if it's necessary, like an old smartphone. And I want to congratulate you on completing this cybersecurity training course. After this module, there will be a short test, and this will measure your abilities to implement the security solutions, and it will test the effectiveness of my training course. Afterwards, there's a short survey. Please fill it out. That way, I can receive feedback that is specific to cybersecurity. And with that being said, I want to thank you for choosing my course, and have a wonderful day. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Spinoza. Welcome to Module 6. This is an extra module, and I think it's very important to go over some browser settings that I think will be very important for you guys. The reason why they are important is because a lot of information and data gets stored in these browsers, and I want to show you what that looks like. Right now, I am in the Firefox browser, and you want to click on Firefox and then on Preferences. Next, we are going to cover all the general settings. These general settings right here in Startup are not very important in uh, data and privacy and tabs. That's not what we're after. We're after the data sharing and the cookies and this is all data that gets saved from websites that can that are high risk and, and can cause harms so right here in applications choose how firefox handles the files you download from the web or the applications you use while browsing this is a high risk right here because let's look at this some of these websites they can track and collect your information and perhaps steal very important credit card information or business accounts or any any private information you don't want to share if you see anything suspicious right here you can click on it and look at it but choose how firefox handles the files you download so this is very important because if you change these settings, it will help you make better decisions. Let's say right here on a portable document format. Let's say I don't know who that is, where it's coming from. If I tell it to always ask, it will create a box. That way, anytime a PDF opens up, it's going to tell me, hey, are you sure you want this document? Uh, do you know if it's safe? or if it's got a virus, and that's why always ask is very important, versus save file. If you choose this option of save file, it will automatically save the file, and you don't know if it's safe or not. You can assign it to the Mac OS default application, or you can use another. Now, uh, hopefully, if you're not uh, an Apple user, don't be distracted by this. Uh, because if you use uh, Mozilla Firefox, uh, it will look the same. It's going to be the same browser, the same internet platform. Uh, this is just going to say Windows. Let's keep moving on because uh, this application is important. But we need to check other settings. Digital rights management content. We don't need to worry about digital rights. Firefox is up to date. It helps when you when you have um, all your devices up to date, making sure that your updates are current. But if you do not need 
the updates for some reason. Um, I don't always use them specifically on my cell phone because it slows it down. I've got an older cell phone and when you check kind of like on these what's new learn more tabs under your update it'll tell you what it does and normally it says what model it's for and because mine is, in, is not the same generation it's not necessary that's why updates don't always apply to people you do want to enable it to be automatically installing updates for you which is recommended but you can also click check for updates but let you choose to install them that way uh, if you don't need them you do not have to it's not a requirement you don't have to install them make sure this is clicked on use recommended performance settings these settings are tailored to your computer's hardware and operating system this will make it faster uh, or more effective for browsing I'm not concerned with browsing right now but network settings I am configure how Firefox connects to the internet Let's click on our settings and see what's going on. Okay. These settings we do not have to mess with. This has to do with connection settings and these are more complicated than, uh, than you need and uh, these do not involve the type of cybersecurity we want. Okay. We finished the general. Let's go on to the home. And right here, there, there isn't much value for cybersecurity. It asks you about windows and tabs. You can change your home homepage, which is this home icon, and you can set it to anything. I normally like to set, uh, set that to my email address. New tabs, I normally like a blank page. Uh, but there are benefits to having the Firefox home default because when you open this like this, it'll show you what you visit. And that is why that's important because it's very functional. So we don't need to go over these. Maybe in search. Okay, now you see how these are listed right here? These search shortcuts this is how data is stored on these search engines and you could just go right here and remove it um these seem to be my shortcuts which are not uh are a high risk but if you see something that you don't want or you don't recognize i highly recommend that you remove it so you would click on it and then you would click on remove Let's get to the meat and potatoes, or the most important part, privacy and security. Here, browser privacy, enhanced tracking protection. Why would it give you an enhanced protection? Well, this is because there are cyber criminals or bad people that use the internet to take advantage of users that are not aware of, of their security settings. So that's why we need extra protection. That way they don't track us online. If you go on any website and you uh, and you click on some um, something that's like recommended or that's sponsored uh, you need to make sure that you know or that you trust that source because that's how somebody could track you trackers follow you around online to collect information about your browsing habits and interests perhaps somebody sees you that you click on one of their articles because you happen to be needing a recipe and he put up some ad for uh, something that you were looking for. Uh, perhaps one of those KitchenAid appliances that, that make baked goods. I don't know what, what they're called. But it's as simple as this. You went online. You typed in KitchenAid mixer. It's probably a mixer. One of those things. This is exactly the one. This is super popular. And a lot of people click on on these on these ads and see i don't know what crate and barrel is but they've got reviews and uh and let's say you are on a on a recipe website and then you're like oh yeah i was quoting these mixers the other day 
and you click on one and you're like Owen shop and, and it's like a it, it's a bad bad source that's where they can track you and they could uh, learn your habits and interests and they could put up an ad of a fake mixer and then you're like yeah I'll buy this one it's got a great price and normally if it's too good to be true it is so watch out for that some of the most uh, important advice I can give people is not only that one but let's click on let's click on reddit perfect so I was working on a academic survey the other day and see how it's got this lock this is a secure connection this is what you want now if you go to a bad connection like the one I showed you uh, up ahead in in the module for algebraic passwords you will see that it has an unlocked locked and it'll tell you that the connection is not secure that is not a website that you can trust and you shouldn't be on it sometimes uh, you can use it like the way I did uh, for something minor if it's private but normally for shopping it's very crucial that you avoid that that connection that website like that mixer example that I gave you guys just now okay so let's quickly go over these make sure if you're gonna have some exceptions for the protection of these websites I don't know if it's like uh, Bronco mail or like something Boise State uh, or like a library database uh, that's something you could add and you could save changes to but otherwise I don't recommend using that make sure this is clicked on standard that way it doesn't have any social media trackers cross-site tracking cookies uh, cookies are like crumbs kind of like a trail uh, and it may, it'll um, it'll keep all this data of all the websites you visit uh, and it'll try to uh, attack you you can also enable this to be strict or stronger or custom to make it uh, something that you want this is very important you can delete I recommend that you click this delete or select it delete cookies and site data when Firefox is closed you can manage data so check it out this is all the stuff I visited and there is just so much once you remove it all or just clear the data which is a lot 700 megabytes almost a gigabyte worth of uh, tracking information you will be more secure you can also clear your history this will clear the browsing history and the downloads and that's very important because it will it will clean clear and erase any data that is not necessary so that will prevent any problems any cyber threats the permissions sometimes you will get a permission from an application that you don't know and and th that's good to have because you want your computer to ask you permission that way if something comes up out of the ordinary like oh I'm not working with this I don't recognize this program it was supposed to be YouTube but it's not it's something else it's like allow access to fast videos online something like that that comes off questionable that's where you you would want to block that permission Firefox data collection use this is questionable um, it does help uh, the Mozilla Firefox organization which they are trustworthy uh, to send them right here the technical and interaction data uh, because the this browser used to crash a lot and so it's got to go through a lot of updates and a lot of repairs digital repairs uh, so I would make the exception for Firefox to share data but uh, with Facebook TikTok uh, snapchat Instagram and YouTube I I wouldn't share data I I also don't think I would share data with um, Apple Safari and Google Chrome browsers or uh, Microsoft Edge um, Firefox I would but uh, it's not it's not necessary and you could and you could check these out off 
You're no longer allowing Mozilla to capture technical or an interaction data. All past data will be deleted within 30 days. That's cool. We, we don't need uh, any more errors. Allow Firefox to install and run studies. Let's not. Let's, let's be very strict on that side of things. Make sure this is on the security, that you've got these settings enabled. Deceptive content and dangerous software protection. Make sure this is enabled. Block dangerous and deceptive content. Block dangerous downloads. Warn you about unwanted and uncommon software. Very strong stuff right here. On the certificates, when a server requests your personal certificate, ask you every time. And this is a, a communication certificate. It has to do with, with the way um, computer systems communicate in a very complex manner using uh, numbers, binary language. Okay, so we've got privacy and security completed.